welcome to worship and to our online worship for the Aurora, Bradshaw, and Phillips United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Michelle Reed and happy to be serving you in this online way as we provide worship for those of you who are at home. A few announcements. First of all, I would say Happy Father's Day to those who are celebrating. We trust that you will spend this time well with your friends and family and loved ones. Also, um, would remind you that there are two more Vacation Bible Schools coming up in our churches, and all kids are welcome to come. Um, the Phillips Vacation Bible School will be August 3rd through 5th, and the Bradshaw Vacation Bible School will be July 13th through 15th. Both, both of those will be from 6.30 to 8 p.m., uh, on those three evenings during the middle of the week. Those are uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday during each of those weeks and we look forward to serving uh, all of the kids from Phillips and Bradshaw uh, in those at those times. I would also say um, be praying for and thinking about those who are going to church camps. Uh, many of our kids are going to different camps around the state in their hometowns, our United Methodist camps and others that are serving our children this summertime. Be in prayer for those staff members as they en enter into July. Uh, they get a little weary from all the kids and all of the work that they do and, and all the sweating that they have to do in, these, in this heat. We pray for the safety of our children and our staff at our church camps. So uh, I thank you for praying for them as well. We'll begin worship today with the song, Take Time to Be Holy. today. I wanted to lift up those who are suffering because of the heat that our um, country is experiencing right now for other places in the world that are suffering drought and heat. 
I'm also praying for those who are uh, facing procedures and testing, surgeries uh, that are coming up, that are dealing with their medical issues. I would lift them all up in prayer. And especially praying for those who are grieving as well, um, lifting up those folks who are living life in a way that um, with an empty spot at the table or in their extended family. Prayers for all of those um, there. Joys this week would be for the joy of our children that are out of school and uh, joy of those who are able to go on vacations and spending time in their favorite places this summer. Um, we give thanks for all of the, the, the opportunities that we have to play in the water and to lie in the shade and to just be outside among God's beautiful creation. So for our prayer today, I'd like to offer up something that came out of a book that Walter Brueggemann wrote uh, during the pandemic early on. It's called Virus as a Summons to Faith. It was a very well-written book. Um, I appreciated all that he wrote, and I, I'm reading um, a prayer near the end of this book that um, really focuses us on not only what we have suffered, but a vision ahead and the hope and trust that we have in God throughout. So let's begin praying together. I'll share this prayer and then I'll invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. We prefer our worship of you, God, should be upbeat. We like it that the church is the happiest place in town. We take our glimpse of your promised kingdom as a venue where never is heard a discouraging word, but then reality, like suffering and death, like pandemic and virus, like loss unimaginable. That reality breaks our happy illusion of a fairy tale life in the first world and we are left with stone cold fear and bottomless need. So we cry out with urgent imperative, hear, help, save. We cry out along with the whole company of people of faith who have cried out. We cry out because our cry since the lips of the slaves in Egypt is our most elemental word back to you, our creator. We cry out not in despair, but in confidence that you hear. You are the one, the only one, who can turn sorrow to joy, mourning to dancing, weeping to laughter. So now, God who hears, helps, and saves, hear, act, and make new, give us courage and patience, let us be rich in soul and poor in things, ordered for neighborliness, generous with goods, free of fear, but mostly. And the virus, help those who need to be vaccinated. We pray this in the name of Jesus who defeated the powers of death, overcame the forces of evil, ended the unbearable vexation of leprosy for some, and became the Lord of the dance, the dance of well-being, gladness, and peace. So we pray, so we trust, so we hope in you. Amen. Now we offer the prayer that Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining in that prayer time and I would invite uh, again those of you who might be able to come on Wednesday evenings at the Aurora uh, Church Community Garden. We have prayer, evening prayer in the garden each Wednesday this summer at 8 p.m.
And now I'd invite you to join in our next hymn. It's called Freely, Freely. messages uh, on the parables of Jesus. The parable that we're going to share this morning is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. It is found in the Gospel of Luke in the 16th chapter beginning with the 19th verse. I invite you to listen for the Word of God. There was a certain rich man who clothed himself in purple and fine linen and who feasted luxuriously every day. At his gate lay a certain poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Instead, dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. While being tormented in the place of the dead, he looked up and saw Abraham at a distance with Lazarus at his side. He shouted, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm suffering in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, whereas Lazarus received terrible things. Now Lazarus is being comforted, and you are in great pain. Moreover, a great crevice has been fixed between us and you. Those who wish to cross over from here to you cannot. Neither can anyone cross from there to us. The rich man said, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. He needs to warn them so that they don't come to this place of agony. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. The rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will change their hearts and lives. Abraham said, If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. So the basic message of this parable is straightforward. You have a rich man who lived his life in luxury, utterly ignoring the desperate Lazarus who was sitting right at the door of his home. 
And because of this, a separation was created between the rich man and God, between the, the everlasting, eternal, abundant life that God offers. And the, the rich man is left in torment. So that's very straightforward. But there's a couple of the images, particularly in the way the story is told, and one, one image that I want to share a few words about before I get to a, a temptation that is hidden for us as readers of this particular parable. The first thing that I want to mention, the parable is obviously very critical of the rich man. And as I've been talking about with all of these parables, the context in which Jesus is having these conversations is very important. In this case, the conversations comes as a result of an argument with the Pharisees, an argument that involves money and other things. Pharisees were, were, were people who were teachers of the, of the law and, and, the, and keepers of the faith in many ways throughout Judah and, and, and the surrounding area. And in this case, Jesus is accusing them of using their position in order to enrich themselves while ignoring the needs of others. So he's intending this parable to, to be a direct criticism of, of their abuse of power and their accumulation of wealth to identify them with the rich man. And we see this in terms of the, the way the story's told, that, that this is about them and, and that community. Because the story is told all about in the way that the rich man sees Father Abraham. So this isn't a conversation with God or with an angel. It's with Father Abraham and all of the, the, the Jewish community, including Jesus himself, were children of Abraham, were descendants of Abraham, would have seen Abraham as, as a father figure. That's, that's who they are. They are the, the, the children of Abraham. And so this criticism, one of the temptations of this criticism is to point toward the Pharisees or the Jewish community and say, look at how terrible they were. And that is always a temptation that, that we have to resist. Jesus was having a family discussion with the Pharisees. He was criticizing those a, a, a part of his own family of descendants of Abraham, as children of Abraham. And we are no law, more welcome to enter into that criticism of the Pharisees and the, and the Jewish community at the time as I would be to enter into a criticism of your children. If you had said something critical about them, it would be inappropriate and inconsiderate for me to, to jump in and, and, and pile on to that, that sort of criticism. Whenever we read this, the idea isn't for us to get a better understanding of how bad people were at the time. But wherever this criticism comes, it's for us to look in the mirror and to read this and see if we can see in our own lives and in the old, our own image that we have created of ourselves and see if this criticism applies to us. Now, one of the images that I wanted to mention, and it's, it's, it's interesting, it's, it's not central to the understanding other than it rebuffs one of the rich man's pleas, is the idea that there is a chasm that separates Lazarus from the rich man, a chasm that neither of them can cross. Now, again and again, I've been talking about putting aside an idea that God is punishing us for this or that or the other thing. I believe that, that there is a torment. The, the parable is clear that there is a torment that the rich man is going through. It's a torment because there is a life, an abundant life, an eternal life in the presence of God that Lazarus is living in this moment. 
And the torment is added to in this parable, whether that's a, a true vision of heaven and hell or not, but certainly within this parable, because he can see Lazarus and Abraham living this life that God has given them. But the chasm, I think, is better understood when we understand who God is. Talked again and again about in God there is no darkness at all. In God, there is only light. And God has invited Lazarus into that life, that abundant life of light. And so for, for Lazarus to have to enter again into the darkness, the darkness that had so overwhelmed him in his, his life on earth, that... There had to be a chasm there that none of the darkness, none of that old torment that was a part of Lazarus's life could ever return. So that to me is a more consistent understanding of why this chasm is here, not to continue the torment of the rich man, but to assure Lazarus that his life will always from this point through all eternity, be the life that God had intended in the light of God's love. Now, the temptation. The temptation that is built into this parable. Because here we have two figures. We have the rich man who, who, who lives a lavish life and is and is covered in, in, in royal expensive clothes of the, of the best fabrics and the most expensive colors and, and feasts abundantly every day. And then you have this absolute stark difference in that Lazarus isn't just unfortunate. Lazarus is absolutely desperate. Lazarus can do nothing but sit at the doorstep of the rich man, hoping for just a few crumbs to fall from the table. But not even that is made available to him, and, and, and instead he can't even protect himself from the dogs who lick the sores of his wounds. And so is this powerful image. So, of course, none of us want to think of ourselves as the rich man. All of us can, can look into our lives and see people who are, who are wealthier than us, who have, have more lavish lifestyles than us, who don't have to work as hard as we do and, and all of those things. So our temptation then is to identify ourselves with Lazarus, to take this story and say, Lazarus suffered great injustice. Lazarus was deprived of so many things that could have made his life so much richer. You know what? So am I. There are so many things in my life that, that other people have that I don't. So many ways that, that other people are, are privileged and advantaged in ways that I'm never allowed to be. What about me? I'm the Lazarus in story, not the rich man. Well, a couple of things about that. One, if we allow ourselves to, to live into that temptation, then we move our way from the whole point of reading the parable in the first place, which is to keep us from being... The rich man, not to keep us from being rich or, or having nice things or, or having joy in this life. But the point of the story is to keep us from falling into the, the life of indifference to others. That it's all about our lavish lifestyle and nothing about helping others. And so if we start to see ourselves as Lazarus, then we pull our way, we, we ignore, we obscure the, the message that Jesus has for us, that this is not the life that you should live, that there is a call on your life 
to look to those at your doorstep who are in need. The second thing that that, that temptation does to, to identify ourselves with, with Lazarus is that it essentially ignores the fact that the scripture never invites us to list the injustices that have been laid upon us. It never invites us to try to show God how desperate we are. It never invites us to justify ourselves over and against one another. This temptation is something that we fall into almost any time any group of people start calling out for justice. Whenever there is a people that is not ourselves who start crying for justice, who can name the ways in which they are held down, the ways in which others are, are, are privileged unjustly and they are, are made more desperate. Our temptation is say, yeah, but what about me? You say you want to be valued in a, in a certain way. What about me? Shouldn't we all be valued in this way? And so we try to make ourselves a Lazarus in those stories rather than identify the ways in which we could, we could help ease whatever the injustice is that is laid out there for us. That we, uh, we try to identify our problems. We try to always look up and see who is above us, who is more privileged, who has more opportunities, who is more advantaged. And we try to pull those people down to us so that we can identify how we are in need of someone else's care. But the call of the gospel is not to tell ourselves we're the rich man, but to keep that image ever before us and realize in order to live this life is to look down and to reach down to those who are in greater need than us, to reach down and lift up those who are in desperation, those who we can bless the way others have blessed us. We're not looking up to see who is better than us, but we are looking down to see who can help, who we can lift up and offer justice and abundant life and, and opportunity to. That's the, the, the call of the gospel in our lives. The image of Lazarus, I believe, is made so desperate in this story because none of us should be able to identify ourselves as as desperate as Lazarus. And if we are, we don't need to identify. Lazarus's lot in life was so poor that no one needed it pointed out that this was not the way anybody ought to be living. Now what we have to have faith in order to be able to always look away from ourselves and toward others who we can bless. We have to have the faith in the, in the thing that is written in this gospel. And the thing that is written in this gospel is that Lazarus didn't beg God to be saved. That's not a part of this story. But when this tremendous suffering that Lazarus went through through all his life finally came to an end, God sent the angels to lift Lazarus up, to carry him to that place of abundant life. We have to believe that God will do that for us, that God will lift us up and out of whatever desperation, whatever brokenness, whatever injustice, whatever 
trials we face in this life, that we don't have to beg God for that. God will do that. And, and as God is doing that throughout our life, we are called by the prophets, by the law, to reach down and find those who will be lifted up. There's one last piece of this that the people who first heard the story, it probably just sounded like a, a, a powerful statement, a, a, maybe a, a, a bit of hyperbole by Jesus, that even one who was risen from the dead came back to them, they would not believe. But those who first read the gospel and us today can look at that and understand what that means to us. We have one who was risen from the dead who speaks to us not something new, but something that has been spoken in the law given to Moses, which doesn't only mean the Ten Commandments. It means all of the, the, the law that Moses spoke to us and, and the others spoke to us in the first five books of the Bible. And from the prophets who are constantly calling us to look to the most desperate, to look to the lost and the least, to be looking down at those who have not climbed as far as we have in the, in the blessings of this life and the riches of this life and lift them up and give them the, the dignity and hope that they need. And we have one who came back from the dead and spoke to us. And we have Moses and the prophets. And if our hearts cannot change with all of those things around us, then we, like the rich man, will create an uncrossable separation between us and the God who is love, in whom there is no darkness at all. So I invite you as a, as a benediction to have the faith in God's love to to reach out to you in your time of need and the courage and the strength to not look at your own hurts but seek those whom you can bless whom you can lift up in, in their times of need I pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit one God, hope of the world Amen